All right, we're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 5 through 12 as we continue a study we just began. I'll be looking at these verses, and we're going to spend some time looking at the righteous judgment of God. We'll get there in a, a few minutes. And as is my normal way of doing things, I'll, I'll go over a few of the things we've already seen, because last time we were together, we looked at verses 1 through 4. And so I'm going to touch on those verses again to lay a foundation, because when we begin our study in verse 5, Paul is actually picking up on some of the things he's already been writing. And so in order for us to get the flow of what he's got to say to this church, we need to go over a few of the things that he's already said. And so I'll do that. I'll give you a prolonged introduction. It'll take several minutes, and then we'll move into verses 5 through 12. So let's begin reading together at verse 5. I'll read to verse 12. We'll get into our study. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning at verse 5, reading to verse 12. Paul writes, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul has been writing to the church of the Thessalonians and has been speaking to them concerning the suffering that they've endured. And in the previous verses, he had encouraged them by reflecting on the obvious fruit that they were bearing. He he even stated that he was obligated to give thanks and to boast on their behalf. And as we've seen, he was obligated to give thanks for at least three reasons. Uh, The first reason that we saw was that the afflictions they endured had refined and strengthened their faith. That's something we pointed to last time together. I pointed to you that we can go through pressures and trials, we can go through afflictions, even persecutions, and they're not intended to do anything other than refine us and to strengthen us. That's what happens when God is moving in your life. He allows things to occur that are intended to remove from you those things that are not pleasing to him and that will hinder you. And they've been going through afflictions and they've been going through pressures and he was thanking God on their behalf because the afflictions they were enduring refined them and strengthened them. In Isaiah 48, the Bible tells us at verse 10, behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. And we're told by Paul that there's a purpose in all of this in Romans 5, verses 3 and 4, because he says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. So we can glory in these things and put up with these things because there's a purpose in these things. So afflictions that they've been enduring is strengthening and purifying them. Secondly, he was obligated to give thanks on their behalf because the afflictions that they had gone through resulted in their love abounding toward one another. Under the pressure that they were going through, through the persecutions and the suffering they were enduring, it would have been easy for them to put themselves first and others after them, but that had not taken place. The afflictions resulted in love and a love that abounded towards other people. Instead of exhibiting self-love, they began to care sacrificially for other people, and in that, he glorified God and was grateful. 
A third thing he thanked God for was that they had patience and faith during their afflictions. In spite of the intense persecution, in spite of the, the pressures that they were going through, they were trusting in God. They came to understand that God was working in the midst of all of those things. Once again, the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 4, verses 12 and 13 said it like this. He said, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. He said, therefore, what we are to do is not think it strange, but actually learn that God is going to work through these things and will give him glory. And that's how genuine believers respond to situations like this. That's how we are to learn to respond in the distresses that we go through. We, we go through and endure these things because there's a purpose. In Romans 8, verses 35 through 37, Paul said this. He said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And so there is good that occurs even in the midst of persecution, tribulation, suffering, and affliction. Persecution against Christians is inevitable. It shouldn't come as a surprise to us when we're rejected. What makes us think that we're not going to suffer? If the church has always suffered, what did, why did I think I'd be exempted from that? In 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul said it like this. He said, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. In Philippians 1.29, Paul said, for to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. It's been granted your privilege to do this, is what he was saying. I was thinking of this as I was preparing this this message, and, and I thought how interesting and how revealing it is um, when Christians get so outraged when they suffer through things. They'll say things like, this is America. I'm not supposed to feel rejected or uncomfortable. But the fact is, Jesus prepared us for this. We shouldn't get caught off guard when we're rejected. We shouldn't get surprised when people are not kind to us. In Matthew 10, 22, Jesus gave us a wonderful promise. He said, you will be hated. Now, isn't that a kind thing to say? But you will be hated, he said, by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. In Luke 6, 22 and 23, he said, blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day. Leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. Rejoice, leap in joy for having people speak poorly of me, excluding me. He said, listen, they did it to those who went before you. Why wouldn't they do it to you? So the anger that Christians exhibit when experiencing persecution is troubling. If the world hated Jesus, why are we surprised when they mock and reject him today? So what is the origin of this kind of reaction to the message of the gospel? Well, it's the result from rejecting the Lord, and this rejection of God is directed towards us. In John 15, verse 20, Jesus said, Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. But he went on to say in the same verse, if they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So that should give us courage to continue sharing and hope that many will believe the gospel. So as Paul is writing here to the Thessalonians, he's blessed that they're growing through their afflictions. They're remaining strong. It's an evidence to him that they're, they're saved, that they're genuinely converted. They have faith in Christ. Somebody said, Men seek an explanation of suffering in cause and effect. They look backward for a connection between prior sin and present suffering. 
The Bible looks forward in hope and seeks explanations not so much in origins as in goals. The purpose of suffering is seen not in its cause, but in its results. So having understanding of afflictions is essential if we're going to grow in our faith in Jesus. So Paul rejoiced because they had an eternal perspective, not simply a temporary one. They weren't focusing on present comfort, personal fulfillment, simple happiness. They weren't moaning about injustice, but were settled on bringing glory to God. And, and that's the heritage we receive from the early church. Read Hebrews in chapter 10, verses 32 through 35. You'll see it there. It says, Recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. You had compassion on me and my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. And so Paul has been speaking concerning this, and he's saying uh, that their attitude uh, is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God. Notice verse 5. He says, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God. Now, he's saying that because he had just said in verse 3 through 4, and I'll read that again, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as is fitting, because your faith shows exceedingly, grows exceedingly, and the love of every, every one of you all abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God. And so the attitude that they display reveals that God is wise as he purges his people through suffering. He said, this is happening with a purpose. Notice in verse 5, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffered. Again, somebody said, this does not mean that Christians will earn the right and deserve to enter heaven because of their sufferings, but that they may show that they have such a holy character that it is proper that they should be admitted there. And so it's demonstrating the wisdom of God. He's refining you, and you're demonstrating that you have been made acceptable to enter into, the, the, into heaven. And so these afflictions and sufferings are, are how God prepared them to enter in. Suffering made them ready for heaven. It caused them to long to be with the Lord. They were going through things, and they're, they're, they're not thinking just, how can I get out of this? They're thinking, I've got a better place waiting me. They, were, they weren't thinking, oh, I just can't take this anymore. They were saying, this is working for good in my life so that one day I'll be entering into the kingdom, into heaven, and I'll be, I'll be prepared for such an experience. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I, and they had an eternal perspective. It's like Romans 8.18, 8, how Paul said, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so I'll go through these things because they are light afflictions. I'll go through these things because they're working for good in my life. Now he says in verse 6, it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulations those who trouble you. The fact that you are suffering persecution justifies God's judgment on the world. He will bless you for the suffering you endured, but he will repay those who caused you pain. In Romans 2 verse 6, it says, God will render to each one according to his deeds. In the book of Job, in chapter 4, verse 8, it reads, Even as I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. And so God is going to take care of this on your behalf. And notice how he says it's a righteous thing with God to, be, to repay with tribulation. Now, I'll notice something with you here. Notice first that God's judgment is declared to be a righteous judgment and a righteous thing. Now, the word righteous isn't a word that we use that commonly today. We used to a long time ago in ancient history when I was growing up. That was a word that we used all the time. We, when we liked something, we'd say it was righteous. So we'd say, man, that's righteous. That's really righteous. And, and it was such a common phrase that there was a, a group, and it wasn't really a group, there was a duo called the Righteous Brothers. And the Righteous Brothers 
uh, got their name because somebody said that when they were singing, they said to him, man, that was righteous, brother. And they said, ooh. And that's how they got their name. That's not in the Bible, but it's true. <laughs> righteous, brother. So when you read the word righteous, you know, it's not a word that you necessarily use all the time. Or when you use it, don't really use it in a biblical sense. The word righteous means correct. It means without error. It's just, it's innocent, it's blameless. God's righteous, and his judgment is righteous. Psalm 51 verse 4 says, Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. And so he speaks concerning the righteous judgment of God, and it's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation. So Paul is encouraging them to wait on the Lord for a righteous judgment. He's the righteous judge. He'll repay them for the suffering they have caused his people. And because of this, they should remain strong and not seek to avenge themselves. You can try and take care of business yourself if you'd like, or you can entrust it to the hand of the Lord. The best thing to do is to cast your cares on the, on the Lord and let him take care of this. In Romans 12, 19, he says, Do not take revenge, my friends. But leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. So the promise is those who have been troubled through persecution will receive rest in Christ. What are you to do? Well, Colossians 3.1 says, if, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, for Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Just look to him and seek those things that are pleasing to him. In 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. When I was teaching at the pastor's conference, I was teaching on endurance. And I was mentioning to them, that, uh, that perhaps I, at this point in my life, have the ability to speak about enduring. And the theme of the, of the conference was enduring. And so I, I shared with them that here, this month, September, it marks my 45th anniversary of teaching my very first Bible study. 45 years I've been teaching the Word. And, and I said, I got ordained in 1979. I pastored this church that I planted in 1981. I said, so uh, 40, almost 48 years of walking with Christ, 45 years of teaching, perhaps I've learned some things about enduring. And so I was sharing with them about that. And I said, listen, if, if you pick up the book of 2 Corinthians, I encourage you to do the same. And you read through the chapters, 13 chapters of 2 Corinthians, you're going to discover that Paul in 2 Corinthians is actually not simply writing a letter, but he's actually answering charges that have been lodged against him by infiltrators who entered into the Corinthian church and were attempting to undermine his ministry by calling into question his credentials. No less than 24 times he answers charges that have been lodged against him, charges that he's fickle and changes his mind easily, charges that he's boring when he's speaking, charges that he's simply ugly, charges that he shouldn't be listened to, he's not worth supporting. And I was sharing with the church that, that he went through a variety of things, including these infiltrators who were calling themselves the eminent ones, super apostles, calling into question this man's ministry. And this man was a man who loved the Corinthians because when you read 1 Corinthians, he says, though ye may have 10,000 instructors, yet you have but one father, I begot you in the gospel. He spoke concerning his jealous love as a father has for a bride, his, his virgin daughter. He said, that's how I feel about you. But in the midst of all that he was going through. And he begins to speak of these things 24 different times, no less than 24 different times he answers charges. He called it a light affliction. Because the way he looked at what was going on is it was lightweight. Because the thing does not measure up weight-wise to the glory that I'll be receiving in Jesus Christ. And that's how, he, that's how he looked at the afflictions. That's how he looked at the pressures. That's how he looked at the things he went through because he knew that he, these things were working together to create an eternal weight of glory, a, a, a weight of glory that he would be receiving reward for because he was faithful to God. So don't give up. You know, God will repay those who have troubled his children. 
In Mark 9, 42, it says, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Now, God is going to deal with those who persecute the church, but God also extends mercy to those who repent, even though they've done so. We think of a man named Saul, a man who was breathing out threatenings against believers in Christ, who obtained letters of, of authority to, to take any that he would encounter who were worshipers of Jesus, put them in chains, bring them back to Jerusalem, try them for heretics, and then see them put to death for, for their heresies and all. We think of this man named Saul in, in the book of Acts. It says in chapter 8, verse 3, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. But after he was saved, we know him now as Paul. There he was on the road to Damascus, breathing out threatening, seeking out those who were followers of Christ so that he might put him in jail and uh, have him put to death and all. We see him arrested by Christ, and he became Paul. And when he began to speak concerning his testimony, we, we've read it, 1 Timothy 1, 13 and 14. He spoke of himself in this way. He said, I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. There are people, perhaps even in this room, but there are people I've encountered and know who were belligerent, intolerant, angry, violent, who would, who would attack people for telling them, about Jesus Christ. I've heard the testimonies of those who have spit in, in believers' faces. Uh, I, I've heard, I, I had a young man in my church who, who was working at a dairy in the local area. Somebody came to buy a six-pack of beer, and this guy, this guy who was working the counter was, had just gotten saved. And, and he came from a kind of a troubled background, and he was a, he was a, he was a tough guy himself. And some guy is buying some beer, and he's wanting to witness to this guy and he doesn't know how. He's a brand new Christian. So he, he says to the guy, you don't need to drink that, you know. And he's, I, I guess he thought that was a smart thing to say. But the guy popped him in the head. And he came to church with a black eye. I said, what happened? He said, I don't know. He's trying to witness Jesus. And the guy hit me in the face, you know. And, and I've seen that. I, I've been around that. So have you probably, you know. And maybe you were somebody who was like that. Maybe you were the angry person that any... Anytime somebody said, I'm praying for you, maybe you were the one who said, keep your prayers to yourself. Don't tell, you know, don't, don't tell. I did that to my mom. My mom, before she was saved, I was so troubled. My mom said to me, I still remember my mom speaking to me, and she said to me, I was in high school, I was 17 years old. She said to me, son, I'm praying for you. And my mom wasn't even a Christian yet. But I was so troubled. And I, I still remember saying, God is a crutch. And if you want to pray, well, I recommend you keeping your prayers to yourself because I don't need your God and I don't need your prayers. So I know anger. I know that anger, that resentment, that, that, that kind of angry response. And, 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 and God does. God does forgive every manner of sin. And, and if you've been guilty of being that angry person because someone, someone loved you enough to say they're praying for you and they love you and you need to be right with God, God forgives you too. If you ask, Paul was that way. He was angry. He, he was, a, he was a, an angry man taking people to jail and wanting them killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. But God forgave him. God forgives us if we ask. But those who reject mercy and persecute Christians receive judgment. In Romans 2, verses 4 and 5, Paul said, Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness? tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Every day that you live, you add to the judgment because every day that you live unrepentant and not a follower of Christ is adding to your account adding to the things that you'll be judged for. You're storing up wrath for the day of judgment. And as a righteous judge, it is proper to repay with tribulation those who cause suffering. 
And those who are troubling the church will receive recompense for doing that. God will repay them. In Psalm 94, 21 through 23, they gather together against the life of the righteous and condemn innocent blood. But the Lord has been my defense and my God, the rock of my refuge. He has brought on them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. The Lord our God shall cut them off. So, verse 6, those who reject Christ suffer tribulation. The word tribulation is a Greek word. It means affliction. And again, tribulation speaks of distress, difficult circumstances, suffering, trouble. He's going to say a little bit more at verse 9, but those who reject Christ will suffer this. But it says in verse 7, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And so he'll give us who are troubled or those in context who are troubled rest. He said, rest with us. The word rest means relaxation or restoration. It speaks of freedom or ease. It speaks of relief. Rest is afforded to those who've been troubled as they follow Jesus. Now, the ultimate rest will be when we're with Jesus Christ. One of my favorite scriptures in, in the Bible is Revelation 21 in verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. When I was four years old, I was playing in the front room at my, at home, at my home. My mom and my younger sister, Madeline, were in the kitchen. And my mom, because we didn't have adequate heating in the house, my mom would bathe my infant sister in the kitchen. She would actually turn on the oven so it would warm up that space. And that's where she would bathe Madeline. And I still remember I was around four, a little over, almost five. My brother was six years old. And we were playing in the front room when we heard the sound of someone falling on the ground. And we had one of those pocket doors. And so I went up it and I opened the door. And it was hard to open, but I finally got it open. And my mother's body fell into the room. And my mom was having an epileptic seizure. I was four less than five, and her body fell at my feet. So I was standing there watching her as she was having this seizure with, you've seen it perhaps, where the saliva is coming out of the mouth, the eyes are rolled back, and I'm looking past her at my, my sister Madeline, who's about a year old, on a sink, precariously seated there, a one-year-old on a sink, and I can't get to her because I have to go over the convulsing body of my mother. And I still remember placing my, my back against the wall with my mother at my feet while my brother panics and runs in circles for a moment, then runs across the street to get the neighbor to come and try and help my mom. And my mom, from that point on, suffered with epileptic seizures for many years. And my mom eventually went through one thing after another. I saw her from the time I was four years old go through nothing but suffering and pain. When, when I was in my 20s, she finally got lupus. She ultimately had taken so much prednisone to try and help her that her hands had become severely arthritic. She, she couldn't hardly walk at the end. And uh, finally, when she was in, in, in her uh, early 80s, my mom, uh, I was in New Mexico, and um, I had done some ministry because my mom lived in New Mexico, and I was on my way to the airport when I got a phone call from my sister Rebecca who told me mama had fallen and busted her back. She broke her back. And my mom spent her last year in a bed, unable to really get out of bed. And she would only uh, get out for bathroom duties or uh, for bathing. And that was it, her last year. And I have a picture of my mom where she's in bed with, the, with the, her computer next to her watching me as I'm preaching, if their little hand raised, because my mom was real, real Pentecostal, to be honest with you, she was kind of like, yeah, hoo -ah. that was my mom, um, 
and she would uh, she she was my greatest fan and and I can still speak to her and still remember speaking to her rather not still speak to her I don't I, I remember speaking to her and saying to her mama mama there'll be a day when there'll be no more crying there'll be no more suffering there'll be no more sorrow there'll be no more pain that God will dry your eyes he will wipe every tear. This is a very special verse to me. It reminds me. Forgive me. It reminds me that God is good. That God is good. No matter what you go through. No matter what you go through. God doesn't leave you. He doesn't forsake you. He is with you. And every tear that you cry, he has a bottle, a bottle of remembrance, and he hasn't forgotten. And so when you go through pain, and you do, and you go through suffering, and you will, and when you're rejected by people, because people do reject us, you have one who never will reject you. You have one who will never leave you. You have one who will never forsake you, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he will stay with you in every way. You need to remember that because there are times that, that life becomes difficult. Let's face it, there are times when, when, when we feel so rejected and we feel so lost and, and we can even question whether or not God really cares. But the Bible teaches that he does, that he loves you, he never forsakes you, and he never leaves you. And so this is a beautiful, beautiful promise. They will receive rest. Now when? Well, it says in verse 7, to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. He says, when the Lord is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. The mighty angels is literally translated the angels of his mighty power. The angels of great rank will accompany him. In Matthew 16, 27, the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then... He will reward each according to his works. So the Lord is revealed from heaven with mighty angels, and he's bringing his reward. But also in verse 8, it says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So those who love the Lord and all at his return, they're going to be given rest when the Lord is revealed. But He's going to take vengeance on those who do, now notice, who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel. It's interesting that flaming fire is a picture of the wrath of God. In Scripture, quite often, God's wrath is expressed by fire. In Psalm 50, verse 3, our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours before him, and around him a tempest rages. Psalm 97, verse 3, a, a fire goes before him and burns up his enemies round about. Hebrews 12, 29, our God is a consuming fire. So notice that God's judgment falls on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel. This is interesting because when it says those who do not know God, know this, that very often in Scripture, in the New Testament, the Gentiles, non-Jews, are spoken of as those who do not know God. Why? Because God did not give them the covenant. He didn't give them the promises. He didn't give them, you know, the temple. He didn't give them all of those things, the priesthood, the scriptures. They were without God. And so when you read your New Testament, very often you'll see that's how they're referred to. In Galatians 4, verse 8, it says, in, Indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not God's. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 5, uh, Paul refers to the Gentiles as those who do not know God. And so what this is, is it's giving to us insight into who's receiving judgment. One, it's Gentiles, those who do not know God. So he says, in flaming fire, take inventions on those who do not know God. But he also says, and on those who do not obey the gospel. Now, when he speaks concerning disobedience, that would refer to the Jews. That's because God had revealed himself to the Jews and they were disobeying him. In Jeremiah 7, 28, so you shall say to them, this is a nation that does not obey the voice of the Lord, their God, nor receive correction. 
Truth has perished and has been cut off from their mouth. So this is a nation that does not obey. The point he's making is judgment falls on Jew and Gentile equally. The Gentiles and the Jews have rejected the gospel and therefore will come under judgment. He says in verse 9, These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. So notice what he says here. He says, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Let me touch on something very briefly. Perhaps some of you perhaps have heard this in the past. Some think the phrase here, everlasting destruction, is speaking of an annihilation. That you're alive, you die, the soul is annihilated. That's not what he's speaking about. Everlasting destruction is a way of speaking of a separation that lasts forever. It speaks of a permanent exclusion from the Lord's presence and his glory. What this is speaking about when he says they shall be punished with everlasting destruction, and this is going to be the cherry part of the study, he's speaking of hell. He's speaking of hell. Permanent exclusion from the Lord's presence and glory. Matthew 25, verse 46, speaks of those who rejected Christ. These will go away into everlasting punishment, the righteous into eternal life. Hell. Hell is God's punishment for sin and for the rejection of the gospel. It has been said it is the final reaction of a holy God to sin. It is the final conclusion of his wrath. When you read your Bible, you see hell mentioned fairly often in the New Testament. It's described in a, a variety of ways. It is described in Matthew 25, 41 as eternal fire. In Matthew 8, verse 12, it is referred to as outer darkness, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. In Revelation 14, verses 10 and 11, it is a place of continuous torment. I had a guy in this church many years ago now who was speaking to me. After a service, he wasn't a believer. He wasn't a Christian. He, his wife had been coming, and he came along with her. And he spoke to me after church, and he had known my wife, Marie, through his wife, who had been a friend of Marie's for a long time. So he knew Marie, and thus he felt at free, freedom to speak to me in the way that he did. So I'm talking 35 years ago. And he's standing there speaking to me, and he says to me, yeah, I'm going to hell. And he had this attitude like, so what? He goes, yeah, I'm going to hell. He goes, what's the big deal? He goes, all my friends are going to go. And he says, we'll just party. And I looked at him, and I thought, well, I told him some things, but I felt, you don't understand what you're talking about. You haven't got a clue what you're talking about. To speak of hell, eternal separation from God, in that way, reveals a darkness of heart and ignorance that is unfathomable. I read a book a long time ago where somebody tried to describe the torment that one would feel being permanently excluded from light, permanently excluded from God. Because hell is also, and I'll show you this in a moment, it's, it's, it's out of darkness. It's an exclusion of God. There's no fellowship, presence of God, no comfort, no mercy, no love. It's, it's, it's all emptiness. It's, it's all vast emptiness. And he said, it, it, he said, the best way I could put this to try and explain it, to try and develop the idea of how terrible it is, he said, if you were to think for a moment Think that you perhaps were, you're in a, a space capsule and you're circling the earth, you're orbiting the earth, and something goes wrong with the capsule and you have to exit and you've got the suit on and you're tethered to the, to the capsule and as you go out to try and, and fix whatever the problem is, that your tether breaks and you begin to float away from your capsule and there's no way for you to get back to that safety. He says, and as you're floating away, 
into darkness, you will never die. You will stay in existence by yourself with your thoughts in that, in that suit for eternity. Now, when you speak of eternity, who can put that into perspective? Somebody said eternity, it would be if you were assigned the job of picking up and counting every grain of sand on every seashore in the world, every grain of sand, and then when you finish, you start over again. And when you finish, you start over again. There is no measurement for eternity. It just is continuous. So when this guy is telling me, oh, I'll party with my friends, my heart was torn because you haven't got a clue what you're talking about. That you are willing to be away from the light and love and compassion and everything of God so that you can still drink and party with your friends. Are you kidding me? That's how cheap you think your soul is. That's how cheap life is to you. That's how weak the God of this universe is in your mind, is that you think that being in hell is a party. Jesus spoke more of hell than he ever did of heaven because he doesn't want you to go there. He wants you to believe him and be with him, that where he is, there you may be also. But people reject Jesus because, like Jesus said, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And the man will say, a night with her or some of that alcohol or a little bit more money, that nice car, better house, better vacation. I'll give it all up. Really, that's what you would give in exchange for your soul. It's cheap, isn't it? But in reality, it's not. Because your soul, redemption-wise, costs the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how precious it is. And so Paul is speaking here about everlasting destruction. And we speak about it in various ways. It's referred to as hell, but it's also called Guiana. But that is the final judgment, the lake of fire. Those who die without Christ will spend eternity in this judgment. Revelation 20, 13 through 15, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. They were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Hell, the absence of God, intense anguish, it is final, and there are no second chances. You know, you could have been raised in, in a, a system that said that, that you'll get a second chance. The system I was raised in was one with a system of purgatory, and, and you'll eventually get out. The Bible doesn't teach that. It's appointed to men to die once, and after this, judgment. There are no second chances. You die in the state that you lived. I will die in faith because I had a relationship with Christ. But if I die without Christ, I die and enter into eternity without that relationship. And so Paul is speaking of this everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Jesus spoke of it in this way in Mark 9, verse 43, as well as verse 45 and 47. Jesus said, if your hand, your foot, or your eye offends you, cut it off, pluck it out rather than entering into hell, into the fire, he says, that is never quenched. Well, some people say, well, how could a loving God send people to hell? Well, the actual case is that hell was not created for man. It was created for the devil. Matthew 25, 41, he will, say, he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. It isn't for you, but you can choose to go there. And there are those in the multitudes who choose to go there. But he goes on to say in verse 10, and he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. When Jesus comes, 
He'll be admired. He'll bring relief to believers, and we will glorify him, and we will give him glory for the salvation he gave to us. In Philippians 3.21, Jesus, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And we will worship him, and we will praise him, and we will sing songs of glory to him. And one of these days, and it's not that long, you will have the opportunity, I will have the opportunity to look into the face of my Savior. There are those who are saying, oh, I want to speak to Paul when I get to heaven. I've got questions. And I say, yeah, please do. That gives me quicker opportunity to be with Jesus. Go talk to Paul and Peter and Mary, whoever you want. Give me some more time with the Lord. You know, one of these days, guys, and it's not that long, we're going to be able to see the Lord. Not only that, we're going to have opportunity to see those who we love who preceded us. I'm going to see my dad. I'm going to see my mom. When Marie and I were young and we were having our babies, we had our firstborn, my Corinne, and then we had our secondborn, our David. But in between David and our next baby, Joseph, we have a baby who died in miscarriage. I still remember when Marie came out of the bathroom holding in her hand our baby. And I still still remember. Some of you have gone through that. They say, oh, what's the big deal? It's, you can have another. What's the big deal? That's my baby. That's my baby. See, so I have a baby in heaven I'm going to be able to see. I have a grandfather, my mama's daddy, who knew Jesus. I'm going to finally meet my grandfather. I have a grandmother that I never met who was a follower of Jesus. I will meet my grandmother and I will have other babies that, that my children, and I won't go into detail about this other than to make the statement that miscarriages do happen in families. And I have grandchildren that I will see in heaven. And I look forward to it, to see them, to be with them, to be with them. And God... God will wipe away every tear. And there will be no mourning. It will be eternal sunshine in the presence of God. And I look forward to that very much. We will worship him and we will praise him and we will honor him and glorify him because he's so good. He says that the name, verse 12, of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So in verse 11 and 12, he's praying that God will count you worthy, fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness, that the name of the Lord Jesus may be glorified. And so I want to close, he says, by praying for these things. One, that God would count you worthy of this calling in other words, that you may remain faithful to him and enter in with him. Two, I pray that God will fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness. In other words, that he will have his way in your life. And then third, that God would fulfill the work of faith with power through you. That God will give to you strength to live for Jesus and be used by him. And, that fi and finally, that by God's grace, the name of Jesus may be glorified in you. This is what we call a pastor's prayer. What would a pastor pray for? That God would count you worthy of his calling, that God would fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness in you, that God will fulfill the work of faith and power through you, and that by God's grace the name of Jesus may be glorified in you. That's Paul's prayer for their church. That's our prayer for this one, that God will work in us that God will use us, that God will be glorified in us, and that as we go forth with this gospel, that we will bring many to the knowledge of sins forgiven through Jesus Christ, that we will be bold and courageous, that we will be willing to be excluded because, in fact, I have been included in his family, and that I'd be willing to be mocked and rejected 
because it's all worth it. <laughs> all these things are light afflictions compared to the weight of glory that we receive through Christ. May we remember that as we go through our days.